Chapter Seven of Pope Adrian the Fourth and Historical Sketch by Richard Raby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven. It was most likely on occasion of this embassy that John of Salisbury, although he mentions other visits paid by him to Adrian, held the interesting conversation with the English Pope, which he reports at length in his Polycratius in that work he says he well remembers how during a sojourn at the papal court in beneventum he was treated on the most familiar footing by his holiness whose habit it was to gather round him a few select friends with whom he would freely discuss a variety of topics and how among others he once asked john to state candidly what he knew of the people's opinion touching the roman church and her head whereupon the envoy of henry using the liberty of the spirit told without disguise all that he had heard in various parts on the subject for example that the roman church the mother of all others showed herself according to many not so much a mother as a stepmother to her daughters that scribes and pharisees sat in her who loaded other men's shoulders with burdens which they would not touch even with their fingers that these said scribes and pharisees played the tyrant over the clergy and bore no palpable resemblance to such shepherds as tread the true path of life but that they heaped up rich furniture ornamented their tables with gold and silver plate distracted the church with controversies and by setting the pastors and the people by the ears that they in no manner commiserated the sorrows of the unfortunate but made merry over the plunder of churches and administered justice not according to the truth but the price then that other people said the roman pontiff himself was a tyrant and that while the churches which their ancestors had built were falling to ruin and the altars stood desolate he appeared abroad arrayed in gold and purple but that the divine wrath would eventually overtake such priests as lived in pride and luxury and levied taxes on the provinces like men who meant to equal the wealth of croesus for the lord had said that as they measured out to others so would he measure out to them and the ancient of days could not lie upon hearing this and much more to the same effect the pope asked john of salisbury what he himself thought who replied that the question very much perplexed him as on the one hand he feared to pass for a flatterer if he went contrary to public opinion and on the other to give offence if he spoke the truth nevertheless as cardinal guido clement had bore witness in favour of the people he john of salisbury dared not contradict him for the cardinal had said that the church of rome contained a world of avarice and deceit from which every evil sprung this he had not said in a corner but before all his brethren in presence of pope eugenius and that he john of salisbury would not hesitate to declare that as far as his experience went he had never seen anywhere clergymen of greater virtue or more opposed to avarice than those of rome such was the gravity and modesty of many of them that in those respects they equalled fabricius while in possessing the true faith they had the advantage over him then with regard to the pope himself as his holiness insisted on being plainly spoken to he would say that inasmuch as the holy ghost could not err so whatever his holiness might teach must be followed though what his holiness might do was not always to be imitated his holiness was styled father and lord of all but why if he was the father did he require presents from his children and why if he was the lord did he not strike awe into the romans curb their insolence and reclaim them to their duty at all this the pope laughed heartily and expressed himself well pleased at having found a man so honest and plain-spoken adding that if ever he should hear anything further to the same purpose by no means to omit reporting it adrian then proceeded to pass his own conduct in review said many things for and against himself and made reflections on the arduousness of the papal office affirming that no other was so full of cares and that no man was more wretched than a roman pontiff for his throne was set with thorns his mantle pierced with sharp points and so heavy as to weigh the strongest shoulders to the ground 
much sooner would he prefer never to have left his native english soil or to have remained forever hidden in his cell at st rome's than to have entered such straits but the divine dispensation had called him and he dared not disobey he further said that it had always been the lord's pleasure that he should grow between the hammer and the anvil that now he prayed the lord would be pleased to put his hand under the burden as it was become insupportable the pope then concluded his observations by relating to the company the fable of the belly and the members which the charges laid at his door suggested to him and which john of salisbury gives at length in adrian's words a fable by the way which assuredly has lost none of its point since those times but remains as pregnant with wisdom for the nineteenth as for the twelfth century pope anastasius the fourth had conferred on the knights hospitallers of jerusalem the privilege of exemption from tithes on their property in consideration of its exclusive destination to the relief of pilgrims and of the poor this privilege soon gave rise to a quarrel between the knights and the clergy of jerusalem who naturally took it ill that so important a source of revenue as the tithes on the possession of the order of st john no doubt constituted should thus be stopped the patriarch reproached the grand master with abusing his privilege and at last grew so embittered that he drew up a charge against him of acts of aggression on the rights of the oriental church for example that the hospitallers allowed all such persons to attend their church as were excommunicated by the bishops and did not even refuse such outcasts the holy sacrament and extreme unction when dying as well as christian burial when dead that when for some great crime silence was imposed on the churches of a town or district the knights were always the first to ring their bells and call the people on whom the interdict was laid to mass for no other purpose than to get the offerings and fees which otherwise would accrue to the parish church that the priests of st john did not on their ordination present themselves according to ancient custom before the bishop of the diocese to ask his permission to do duty therein that the bishop was never advised of the lawful or unlawful suspension of a priest lastly that the knights of st john absolutely refused to pay tithes on their property from these general charges the patriarch next descended to particular ones of affronts to himself for instance that as the hospital of st john stood opposite the church of the holy sepulchre the knights had erected their buildings on a scale of magnificence superior to the latter church purely out of a feeling to insult the patriarch moreover that when the patriarch ascended according to traditional usage the place of our saviour's passion to absolve the people from their sins and preach to them the hospitallers invariably set out their bells a-ringing with such violence as plainly proved that they meant to drown his voice and interrupt him in the performance of his duty that when he had often complained to the citizens of this misconduct and these had expostulated with the perpetrators the latter only replied that they would yet play him worse turns that they had in fact kept their word for they had shot arrows at him in the church itself while celebrating there the divine offices these arrows he the patriarch had caused to be picked up and exposed in a bundle on mount calvary as a memorial with these charges the patriarch attended by other oriental prelates set out for italy to lay his case before the pope after running many perils by reason of the war then going on between the pope and the king of sicily the party at last reached beneventum the trial that took place lasted several days when the result of the pleadings for and against was that adrian became convinced of the hollowness of the accusations laid by the patriarch against the knights of st john and therefore refused to grant the redress sought for namely to annul the patent of privileges conferred by anastasius william of tyre who describes the transaction as a partisan of the patriarch plainly says that the pope took bribes to decide as he did but Paggi denies this flatly and affirms that adrian proceeded in this as well as in every other act of his authority conscientiously and disinterestedly 
indeed it is rather unfortunate for william of tyre that the three cardinals whom he alone accepts from the charge of bribery two namely octavian and john of st martin afterwards figured as principal actors in the scandalous schism which rent the church after adrian's death the first as frederick barbarossa's antipope under the name of victor the fourth in opposition to alexander the third the lawful pope the second as victor's legate and as chief supporter after his death of anacletus the third whom the emperor next started against alexander peter of blois too in his letter to cardinal papensius describes octavian as having passed his whole life in amassing riches wherewith to disturb the church and as having been but too successful in corrupting a powerful party in the roman curia to his views it had always been a leading concern of the popes to heal the schism between constantinople and rome adrian did his part though fruitlessly towards so great a work shortly after his accession he sent to the emperor constantine legates on the subject who also carried a letter from the pope to basilius bishop of thessalonica one of the most influential and well-disposed prelates in that day in the east this letter was to request his cooperation in bringing about the reunion of the severed churches basilius made answer that unity might easily be restored as no essential difference of belief existed between the two communions in both of which one and the same doctrine was taught and one and the same lamb namely christ offered up for the sins of the world though without doubt some minor discrepancies existed between the two whose removal however belonged wholly to the pope who as he had the will had also the power no less than our saviour himself to unite into one what stood now so widely separated basilius would thus seem to have been of opinion that he was in no wise cut off from the catholic church notwithstanding the oriental might differ in certain rites from the western church it was an old and gross abuse of the age that the nobles asserted the right to seize the effects of a bishop on his death this abuse did not escape severe censure from several synods but pope adrian it was who condemned it the most effectually by his bull to berengarius archbishop of narbonne a d eleven fifty six on occasion of ermengarda viscountess of narbonne renouncing the abuse in favour of that prelate which renunciation the papal bull was issued to confirm in the year eleven fifty raymond count of barcelona made a similar renunciation by charter when about to go on a distant and perilous journey in it he says i hereby promise to god to abolish the detestable custom which has hitherto prevailed in my states to wit the custom whereby my bailiffs plundered the goods of a bishop when he died a proceeding which i own to be contrary to divine and human laws wherefore i renounce the said custom and order that for the future if anything be found in the house or grounds of a bishop deceased it shall be reserved for his successor end of chapter seven chapter eight of pope adrian the fourth an historical sketch by richard raby this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight the peace which adrian had concluded with the king of sicily was soon seized by frederick barbarossa as the pretext for a new quarrel with the church the grounds on which the german despot professed to be aggrieved were as follows a predecessor of his lothar the second had in his italian war in the foregoing century obliged the king of sicily to own the feudal superiority of germany over apulia pope innocent the second who protested against this proceeding as a violation of his rights could only so far induce lothair to respect them as to agree to let their lawful owner for the future jointly exercise them with their lawless usurper so that when the sicilian king as duke of apulia should be presented at the ceremony of his installation with a flag the pope was to hold the pole with one hand and the emperor with the other 
frederick barbarossa renewed this right of joint lordship over apulia by a concordat with eugenius the third in which he expressly stipulated not to make any treaty with the king of sicily without the previous consent of the pope who however was not required to enter into any such obligation towards the german monarch and yet frederick now put on the face of an injured man declaring that what had not been stipulated had yet always been taken for granted and that adrian by making peace with king william unknown to the emperor had frequently violated the concordat in the height of his ill-will an incident fell out which gave free vent to his animosity against the pope to settle his power in burgundy he summoned a diet of the empire to meet at besancon in october eleven fifty seven this diet was numerously and splendidly attended not only by german but by foreign princes and ambassadors from all parts of europe among the rest by two cardinals named roland and bernard as legates from the pope the emperor received their credentials in his oratory where he gave them a special audience at which they also presented him a letter from adrian who complained in it of the impunity with which frederick had allowed certain marauding knights to detain and plunder eskill archbishop of lund while travelling through burgundy to his diocese in chiding him for so faithless a discharge of his duty as sworn champion of the roman church the pope reminded the emperor of the favours he owed the church especially mentioning among them his imperial crown not that she repented of having so far obliged him on the contrary she would rejoice if she could confer on him still greater benefits as frederick listened to this letter which his chancellor reynald read up to him he reddened with anger at that part of it which spoke of his crown as a gift of the church but at the word benefits he could not control himself for by this word he insisted in the blindness of passion that the pope meant to assert that the empire was a fief of the holy see the fact was the original word beneficium did signify in the corrupt latin of the middle ages a fief as well as a benefit in general and this was enough for the emperor's humour who would listen to no explanation from the legates that the word was used not in its technical but its classical sense in the heat of the dispute which ensued cardinal roland afterwards pope alexander the third exclaimed from whom then hath the emperor his dignity if not from the pope whereupon the count palatine otho of bavaria one of the courtiers present seized by a fit of fury drew his sword and rushed towards the cardinal but was checked in his purpose by frederick who threw himself between the two and then closed the audience by ordering the legates to be escorted back to rome with injunctions not to deviate from the directest line of route nor to tarry in any ecclesiastical domain through which they might pass historians are agreed that adrian had no intention in the present case of practically asserting as frederick and his politic wrath said he did the feudal superiority in question the english pope however was not the less a stickler for that superiority in theory as well as cardinal roland and the rest of the hierarchy a superiority which pope gregory the seventh supported by the feelings and convictions of christendom at his day taught as follows that the pope as vicar on earth of our lord in heaven ought to stand superior over every human power and sought to realize it as the only means of reforming the frightful disorders of that age frederick barbarossa on the other hand took as was natural to a man like him bent on crushing the spiritual beneath the temporal power the opposite side of the question a side which was just as repugnant to the feeling of the overwhelming majority of christendom then as it was a century before nay which was at variance with his own conscience if one may judge from his conduct at a later period when abandoned by fortune and his pride humbled in the dust he was driven to hearken to its voice for the present he proclaimed the only doctrine which his pride could brook namely that he held his crown from god alone to whose servant the pope it simply belonged to perform the ceremony of coronation 
this doctrine of his imperial dignity he caused to be stated in a circular which he addressed to all the provinces of germany in vindication of his behaviour towards the papal legates a measure rendered imperative by the religious temper of the age in this circular he denounces all who differ from its views as enemies of the doctrine of our lord and his apostles as in short their slanderers and among other extravagancies of his virulence declares that one cause among the rest why he so unceremoniously dismissed the legates was the discovery which he had made of blank papers in their possession ready signed and sealed which they could fill up at pleasure and which were meant to empower them to dismantle the altars plunder the sacred vessels and deface the crucifixes in the german churches he further informs the bishops of germany that he and he alone it is who really strives to protect their liberties against the roman see whose yoke they groaned under those however to whom this consoling piece of news was sent knew but too well what a mockery the word liberty was in the mouth of a man who like frederick had long ago trampled on the concordat of worms and who disposed of the benefices of the church after the arbitrary manner of henry the fourth to subserve his political ends as companion piece to his circular frederick published an edict forbidding in future all correspondence between his clergy and rome the account which the cardinals roland and bernard gave on their arrival at rome of the way in which they had been treated by frederick created a lively sensation at the papal court the imperial party at the conclave sought to exculpate their patron in the face of the reproaches heaped upon him by ascribing all the blame to the ignorance and mismanagement of the legates in the midst of the conflicting opinions of his clergy pope adrian deeply felt the indignity which he had suffered in the persons of his representatives but did not allow himself to be betrayed into any violent manifestation of displeasure on the contrary after the first excitement of his feelings was over he wisely resolved to do all in his power to conciliate the emperor without derogating from his own dignity to this end he wrote a brief of which the substance is as follows to all the archbishops and bishops of germany as often as anything is attempted in the church contrary to the honour of god and the salvation of souls it should be the care of our brother bishops and of all who profess to act according to the holy spirit to chastise such deeds as have been wickedly done in a manner pleasing to god our illustrious son frederick emperor of the romans we say it with profound sorrow hath lately done what so far as we know is without example in the times of his predecessors for on our sending him two of our worthiest brethren namely cardinals bernard of st clement and roland of st mark our chancellor he appeared at first to receive them with cordiality but the next day when they read to him our letter he broke out into such violence of passion at a certain expression contained therein namely we have conferred on thee the benefit of the crown that it is lamentable to think of the reproaches which he is said to have cast on them of the insults which he obliged them to bear from him of the dishonourable manner in which he dismissed them from his presence and drove them out of his states and then he issued an edict forbidding you to leave the kingdom to visit the apostolic see concerning which things though we are much troubled yet we derive the greatest consolation from this that he did not go to such lengths by your advice or by that of his princes wherefore we feel assured that by your advice it will be easy to recover him from the infatuation of his mind for which reason brethren since it is plain that in this matter not only our but your cause and that of the entire church is at stake we exhort you in the lord to oppose yourselves as a wall before the house of god and to spare no pains in reclaiming as soon as possible our said son to the right path 
taking special care at the same time that reynald his chancellor and the count palatine who dared to vomit out the greatest blasphemies against our said delegates and the roman church make full and public satisfaction to the end that as many ears were wounded by their virulent speech so many may be reclaimed by their return to the right path and let our said son reflect on past and present events and enter on that path along which it is known that justinian and other catholic emperors walk as by following their example he will not fail to obtain honour on earth and happiness in heaven you too should you succeed in reclaiming him will at once offer a grateful tribute of obedience to st peter and assert your own and the church's liberty at all events our illustrious son will learn from your admonitions will learn from the infallible gospel that the most holy roman church built by god's hand on a most firm rock however much she may be shaken by the winds will yet endure throughout all ages under the lord's protection this brief threw those to whom it was addressed into no small perplexity for while on the one hand they secretly leaned to the cause of the church they had become on the other so cowed and truckling under the iron despotism of the emperor that they felt themselves unequal to the task of responding to the pope as their duty prompted so that they resolved after some deliberation on the subject to lay the brief before frederick and to square their reply according to his remarks these were a tissue of the most contemptible subterfuges and trifling as for example that he had issued no edict against his clergy passing into italy as pilgrims and all others that wished to go thither on reasonable grounds attested by their bishops could still do so that he was chiefly actuated in his proceedings by the wish to correct those abuses under which his churches were overtaxed and the discipline of his convents almost ruined that though god had raised the church by means of the state yet the church now sought to overthrow the state a requital which he frederick viewed as by no means divine that the evil designs of the church against the empire were not only proved by her writings but by the pictures which contrary to the imperial wishes were allowed to continue undefaced at rome under one of which representing the emperor conrad kneeling to the pope and receiving the crown an inscription asserted that he did so as the vassal of his holiness for the rest the bishops begged of the pope to appease their sovereign by apologetic letters so that the church might continue at peace and the empire lose none of its dignity adrian smiled at the perverse spirit of pride which this reply from the german hierarchy showed frederick to be possessed of and took only the firmer resolution to get the better of him by opposing a calm dignity to his passion he accordingly selected cardinals henry and hyacinth men of more experience in diplomacy than the rest of their brethren in the conclave to go as legates on a new embassy to the emperor who in the meanwhile had arrived at augsburg to review his troops previous to his second invasion of italy the two cardinals after being plundered and imprisoned on their passage of the alps into tyrol by robber knights who infested those parts and aware of the quarrel between the emperor and the pope thought they might thus turn it to account but were severely punished for their pains by henry duke of bavaria who freed the sufferers enabled them to reach augsburg in safety where they had audience of the emperor the brief which they read to him from the pope expressed the sorrow of his holiness at finding how greatly the term beneficium had been misunderstood and declared that no other than its ordinary meaning in the latin language was intended by it and that the meaning of fief had not for a moment been entertained moreover the word contulimus in speaking of conferring the crown was explained to have meant not that his holiness had done so as though the emperor were his vassal but that he had simply set it on the emperor's head an act whereby it might be supposed that at least a feeling of thankfulness and good will would be produced 
the brief ascribed to maliciously disposed persons the wrong interpretation given to the pope's words which had so deeply incensed the emperor and concluded by recommending to his good favour the legates now accredited to him frederick professed himself pacified by this brief and as soon as some other points of difference were at his request satisfactorily settled he embraced the cardinals in token of his reconciliation with the pope and loaded them with such rich presents that they returned home in the best humour end of chapter eight Chapter Nine of Pope Adrian the Fourth and Historical Sketch by Richard Raby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine. This reconciliation lasted but a short time, for as Adrian was not a character to tamely submit to any invasion of his rights, he could not long keep on terms with a man like Frederick Barbarossa towards the end of eleven fifty eight frederick after reducing milan held a great diet on the roncalian plains between cremona and placentia at which not only his german princes and prelates but many italian bishops and nearly all the consuls of the cities of lombardy were present a papal legate also appeared at this diet frederick caused certain doctors of roman law from bologna to pronounce what were and what were not his legal rights in italy after due investigation they awarded to their formidable client such a monopoly of fisheries mines customs taxes and other dues under the name of regalities that hardly anything in the entire country remained over to which the emperor could not lay claim under that title the consequence was that the various towns dioceses convents and chapters saw themselves deprived at a blow of rights and properties which they had long possessed and fairly acquired it was impossible for adrian not to look with the liveliest displeasure at such old stale spoliation on the part of his imperial son whose victims formally submitted to their fate out of sheer terror and impotence of resistance but when in the face of former oaths and pledges to uphold and make good all the rights and properties of the holy see frederick began with reckless effrontery to wrong that see by investing his uncle duke guelph the sixth with tuscany and sardinia in fact with the entire inheritance of the countess matilda who as is well known had bequeathed it to gregory the seventh and his successors for ever the pope's right thereto having been formally acknowledged by the emperor lothar when however frederick began to levy tribute on other possessions of the church and did so under pretence of his imperial prerogatives in rome when from these temporal he passed to spiritual usurpations and intruded firstly his chancellor reynold into the vacancy of cologne contrary to the provisions of the treaty of worms to which he was sworn and secondly his favourite guido of blandrate into the see of ravenna in direct opposition to the pope's wishes to whose episcopal jurisdiction guido as subdeacon in the roman church was exclusively subject and by whom he was destined for other and more suitable preferment then at last adrian's indignation could contain itself no longer and he addressed to the emperor a brief in which under a forced calmness and moderation of style his soreness at the outrages committed against him is yet plainly perceptible this brief was carried to the emperor by a messenger of inferior rank who moreover did not wait for an answer but disappeared as soon as he had delivered it this is asserted by some to have been meant as an insult to frederick who at any rate took care to view it as such adrian however was surely of too lofty a character to descend to such a petty act of spleen and it is far more likely that the messenger aware of what sort of letter he was carrying and to what sort of person did not care under the circumstances to do more than his bare errand but that done to save himself hastened from the very possible consequences to his poor limbs of the first ebullitions of the imperial wrath 
be that as it may frederick determined to let the pope see that he too could act as meanly and spitefully as it was pretended his holiness had acted and accordingly he gave his secretary orders to set in his reply the name of the emperor before that of the pope who at the same time was to be addressed in the second person singular contrary to etiquette which even in that age required the plural number to be used towards persons of high rank to this insolence of frederick adrian rejoined shortly and pithily rating him for his irreverence to the holy see and to st peter demonstrating to him how his present conduct belied his former oaths and warning him lest in seizing that which had not been given to him he should lose that which had frederick conscious of the grave nature of his crimes against the holy see but so long as fortune favoured him obstinate in his pride and deaf to religious reproach retorted adrian's reproof more audaciously than ever the imperial bully now bid the pope in plain terms stick to those things which as he said christ was the first to perform and teach the law of justice said he has restored to every one his own and he frederick will not fail to pay the full honour due to his predecessors by preserving intact the dignity and crown which they had transmitted to him why he was not to require feudal oaths and service from bishops who professed to belong simply to god is all the more incomprehensible to him as christ the great teacher of all men freely paid taxes to caesar for himself and peter by so doing proceeds frederick he gave thee adrian an example to follow and a lesson of the last importance in those words learn of me for i am meek and humble of heart from this sacrilegious irony he passes to vulgar abuse and tells the pope that his legates had been turned out of germany because they were not preachers but thieves not lovers of peace but heapers of money not reformers of the world but insatiate seekers of gold did pope sylvester he asked possess any temporal lordship in constantine's time and did not the popes afterwards owe all their temporal power to the generosity of that prince and the rest of frederick's predecessors in conclusion he remarks that it was because he saw the monster pride seated even in the chair of peter that he felt moved to use the language he did this letter was well calculated to provoke adrian's deepest indignation but as he never allowed his passions to get the better of his judgment and always knew how to curb the liveliest movements of personal wrath when the interests of the church were at stake heartily tired moreover of the petty rubs on which the dispute between him and frederick was by the latter ostensibly made to hinge he bestirred himself once more to effect a reconciliation compatible with his duty and character to this end he sent an embassy of a more stately description than had ever represented a pope before composed of five cardinals one of whom was a personal friend of frederick to the emperor at bologna whither he had arrived soon after easter a d eleven fifty nine to pass sentence on the milanese who in the meantime had again sought to shake off the german yoke the terms which this embassy was instructed to demand as fair and equitable were as follows that for the future no imperial agent should exercise pretended imperial prerogatives in rome without the foreknowledge of the pope that no levies on the domains of the church except when he was crowned that the italian bishops should not take oaths of particular but only of general homage that the possessions of the roman church and the revenues of ferrara massa veronola of the matilda inheritance of the country between aquapadenta and rome of spoleto sardinia and corsica all acknowledged in the middle ages as indisputable fiefs of the holy see should be restored at first the emperor haughtily refused to grant these conditions then on further reflection offered to abide by the decision of a committee of arbitration to consist of six cardinals chosen by the pope and six bishops chosen by himself 
but adrian as frederick foresaw and reckoned upon at once rejected this offer as derogatory to the dignity of a supreme pontiff which regarded by christendom as superior to every temporal jurisdiction could not therefore bow to one at the same time he reminded the emperor of his concordat with pope eugenius and called on him to stand to it frederick rejoined that he considered himself exonerated from it as adrian had been the first to break it by his treaty of peace with the king of sicily that this charge was a false one has already been shown the emperor persisted in his proposition for a committee of arbitration as both parties continued inflexible all prospect of a reconciliation vanished indeed measures of a hostile character seemed on the point of being resorted to on both sides for while frederick gave audience to a republican embassy from rome and appeared to listen favourably to the overtures made adrian openly exhorted the lombards to persevere in their resistance to the emperor and formed fresh relations with the king of sicily he also addressed a brief to the archbishops of mainz cologne and treves in which he gives his feelings full vent and asserts the superiority of his dignity over the emperor's in the true spirit of the hierarchy of that age praised be god in the highest writes he that ye remain faithful while the flies of pharaoh sprung from the abyss of hell and driven about by the whirlwind are turned to dust instead of darkening the sun according to their wish thanks be to god who doubtless hath enabled you to perceive that betwixt us and the king there can be no more fellowship this schism caused by him will yet rebound upon his head yes he is like the dragon that would needs fly through the midst of heaven and draw after him by his tail the third part of the stars but toppled into the abyss and left to his successors nothing but the warning that he who exalts himself will be humbled thus does this fox who is your hammer too think to lay waste the lord's vineyard thus does this wicked son forget all gratitude and godly fear not one of his promises has he kept everywhere has he deceived us and deserves therefore our ban as a rebel against god and as a true heathen and not only he but also we say it for your warning every one who seconds him yea every one who either in word or thought agrees with him he sets up his power as equal to ours as though this last were confined to a mere corner like germany to germany which till the popes exalted it passed only for the smallest of states did not the german kings travel about in an oxen-drawn chariot like any poor philosopher till pope zacharias consecrated charles do they not still hold their court in a forest at aix whereas we reside at rome even as rome is above aix so are we above that king who boasts of his world-wide sway while he can hardly keep in check one of his refractory princes or even subdue the rude and foolish race of the frieslanders in short he possesses the empire through us and that which we gave him on the supposition of gratitude alone we can resume do ye admonish him after this manner and reclaim him to the right path to peace with us for it will plunge you also into ruin if there be schism between church and state it may easily be supposed that words like these would be ill calculated to arrest frederick's unprincipled career nor of course did adrian expect they would he rather acted now under the persuasion that conciliation had reached its limits inasmuch as further concessions would dishonour his dignity and be a dereliction of his duty as chief pastor of the christian church the unconditional subjection of which under the brutal sway of the civil sword frederick plainly proved that it was his great aim to effect adrian therefore resolved now that every advance and self-sacrifice on his side consistent with reason and justice had been made in vain to arm himself with those thunders which the arm of a pope only can launch and which the feelings of christendom rendered so dreadful even to the most potent and hardened offenders 
to this course he was impelled all the more as frederick in further proof of his contempt of the most sacred obligations when they stood in the way of his ambition shortly added to his crimes against the church another against public morals by wantonly repudiating out of motives of state policy his lawful empress to marry in her stead beatrix of burgundy any remnants of hesitation to adopt extreme measures which adrian might still cherish were completely eradicated in his mind by this crying scandal and he at once prepared a ban of excommunication against the emperor but in the moment of fulminating it death paralyzed his arm this happened september first eleven fifty nine near anangia in the campagna and according to william of tyre in consequence of a quinsy Paggi relates that the partisan of frederick told a story to this effect that pope adrian died by a judgment of god who permitted him while drinking at a well a few days after denouncing excommunication against the emperor to swallow a fly which stuck in his throat and could not be extracted by the surgeons till the patient had expired through the inflammation produced by the accident adrian however did not excommunicate the emperor at all but died on the eve of doing so his body was carried to rome and entombed in a costly sarcophagus of marble beside that of eugenius the third in the nave of the old basilica of st peter in the year sixteen o seven on the demolition of this church the body was exhumed and found entire as well as the pontificals in which it was arrayed it was reinterred under the pavement of the new basilica according to pagi pope adrian the fourth composed catechisms of christian doctrine for the swedes and norwegians a memoir of his mission to those nations de legatione sua various homilies and a treatise on the conception of the blessed virgin performances which appear to have perished the work describing his mission to the north must have been of great interest for the light which it no doubt threw on the history and manners of those countries Mincher, the church historian of denmark mentions that he sought to discover it at rome but without success it being supposed if still extant to lie buried beneath the impractical hordes of the vatican cardinal bozo an englishman and pope adrian's private secretary whom he sent out on a mission to portugal wrote a life of his patron but so invaluable a work is also unavailable as no trace of it now exists from an anecdote preserved in william of newbridge adrian the fourth would seem to have pushed integrity in money matters to a harsh extreme and so to have proved himself the antipodes of those popes who afterwards practised nepotism for it is related of him that rather than award a pittance towards the relief of his aged and destitute mother out of those ample revenues which as pope he had at his disposal but which he did not feel himself justified in diverting to private uses he allowed her to subsist as best she could on the alms of the chapter of canterbury notwithstanding the incessant conflicts of his short career he yet found time to do something towards the improvement and decoration of rome to this end he projected and carried out various new buildings and restorations consisting in churches within and without the city in castles for the protection of the campagna and in additions to the lateran palace the duration of his pontificate comprised four years and eight months End of chapter 9. End of Pope Adrian the Fourth, an historical sketch by Richard Raby.